so welcome back students so we are continuing with the phosphoric acid manufacture so the previous two lectures we have seen the source of phosphoric acid the ores of phosphoric acid and also we have seen two processes the dihydrate process and the hemihydrate process in detail including the process closing this current lecture will actually what we do is that we will discuss the emission abatement in the phosphoric acid this may be as a uh, sample uh, case study for phosphoric acid of the how to conform to the emission standard this may be applicable to other industries also so our current lecture thus discusses the emission abatement in phosphoric acid plants so what we will see in overall we will see the emission abatement so where the uh, you know this uh, mainly the emission means the pollutant gases are coming from the source of the gases source of the gases we will see mainly it will be fluorine fluorine we will study the fluorine based gases then the raw material storage how the raw material should be storage or the product the phosphoric acid should be stored the major hazards concerning with phosphoric acid and then the occupationally health and safety and the summary of bat emissions levels so bat is best available technique so best available techniques are usually followed in uh, industries in us and the uh, europe so they have come up with this bat best available technique and they have set some permission limits in the environment so we will see that in the later stages so the major uh, source of the pollutant in the both hemihydrate and dihydrate process are the gaseous and liquid effluents that are discharged from the processes so we have seen that in hemihydrate and dihydrate process you have only the difference in the number of water molecules which are present as the final product that is in the gypsum so obviously then it implies that you will have a gypsum content the fill the cake content as the major product as the by product i would say the phosphoric product is your main product and uh, the phosphoric acid along with the by product the by product will have some other impurities present for example the fluorine containing gases or the fluorine containing liquids so we'll see what are those so distribution if i uh, try to write out the elemental fluorine distribution in both the processes you see so in the acid it is around 15% to 12% okay the final acid so because the acid uh, once it comes out then you know what you do is you concentrate it in evaporator so there itself there also you have this fluorine gas liberated so it can be liberated during the final product because you have only the concentration of p2o5 is 26% so you need to concentrate it to make it 54% so it means you will have fluorine in that particular acid product then the final by product phosphogypsum so we call this phosphogypsum because it comes from the phosphoric acid process phosphoric acid plant so these are usually uh, compounds of calcium sulfate hydrate so these are the part of by product or you may say it is unwanted product other than gypsum so this is the fluorine within this phosphogypsum i mean i'm not taking this the entire thing as unwanted it is the fluorine within this calcium sulfate that is unwanted so the fluorine uh, if i want to see it is almost similar with both dihydrate and hemihydrate process the final step then you have the reactor off gases so the where the phosphoric acid reaction takes place you must recall what we did we reacted the ore with sulfuric acid and uh, then we what we did is we recycled a part of the weak phosphoric acid back to the reactor so that the calcium sulfate layer is not formed onto the ore so we want to prevent that reaction so to prevent we actually recycle a part of the weak phosphoric acid so that is our uh, reactor of gases i have mentioned earlier in the hemihydrate and dihy dihydrate and hemihydrate process you have the off gases which are actually condensed and then treated then flash cooler vapor very less in dihydrate and some amount is there in hemihydrate this is the major constituent in the hemihydrate then a concentrated vapor because once you do the concentration so means you increase the percentage of acid so you may have some concentrated vapor around 35% so you see this is distribution where the fluorine may be present so now let us see uh, what are these two differences in processes and how the fluorine comes into this so fluorine here in the case of uh, i'd say the dihydrate process it is released as a hydrogen fluoride during phosphate rock acidification so when the phosphate rocks reacts 
with sulfuric acid you have hydrogen fluoride gas to be evolving. This halogen fluoride gas quickly combines with silica which is already present to create fluorosilicic acid via silicon tetrafluoride. So, you have calcium fluoride which is already there, it picks up hydrogen from the acid, forms hydrofluoric acid and you have the calcium 2 plus ions liberated. So, this hydrogen fluoride acid then reacts with the silica to form silicon tetrafluoride and then water and this again reacts with further water to form fluorosilicic acid. So, this is the fluorosilicic acid which is the unwanted product or acid which has to be removed. So, one way is you remove the acid itself or another way is to remove the fluorine itself. The fluorine can be removed using a gas scrubber is a common way of removing fluorine. So, the issue is in a, di in a dihydrate process, if I want to focus on only dihydrate process, the heat of reaction. So, this reactions will only occur when it has a certain temperature and uh, where does this temperature come from? It comes from the reaction of the ore with the acid. So, the heat of reaction it says during acidification is very less than that necessary for it decomposition. So, usually in, in dihydrate process, the fluorosilic acid is not expected to form, but still it gets formed. Why? Because the issue comes in the concentrator. So, as weak phosphoric acid is concentrated, because when you are concentrated, so obviously you want to take the hydrogen out. So, this hydrogen then combines with fluorine to form fluorine based compounds means it will just uh, like you know this will combine to form fluorosilicic acid. Why? Because this concentration process it carried out in vacuum evaporators. So, conditions of increased temperature and decreased pressure result in the breakdown of the fluorosilicic acid. So, this fluorosilicic acid if it is produced in the concentrator which is vacuum operated then it may break down. So, this acid if breaks down in the presence of heat, so this is very uh, difficult then again you re release silicon hydro uh, tetrafluoride and high HF, so this we have to prevent. So, it is not that the co-production in the reaction, it is in the concentrator where the dihydrate, the fluorosilic acid is, product, is produced and if this acid is produced, if further addition of heat then again decomposes to silicon tetrafluoride and HF. Let us look at the other process. So, majority of fluorine in the hemihydrate process, the majority of the fluorine is produced during acidification it says. So, in the previous case dihydrate it is in the concentration process and in here it is in the acidification. Depending on the cooling arrangement, now if, if you recall we have that uh, you know that reactor and above the reactor you had a cooling arrangement, a flash cooler was there. So, depending upon that arrangement, fluoride will actually exit the reactor with the within the vacuum cooler, condenser water or with the cooling air. Whether it is getting absorbed into the liquid water in the case of vacuum condenser or it escapes as a off gas, we have to capture them. So, in the former, the former means if it escapes in the vacuum cooler condenser water, the condenser water has to absorb the majority of the emitted fluoride. And in the latter, if it escapes as a gas phase, uh, gas washing is required. So, what happens in a nutshell, if I want to put it in a nutshell, in a dihydrate process, fluoride must be extracted from the gas produced during acidulation and the gas produced during concentration, this is you should remember. And in hemihydrate process, during acidulation additional fluoride is produced and can be eliminated from the reactor gas. So, it is eliminated in the hemihydrate process in the, as I told you, either it can be through condenser water or the cooling air. So, ultimately, you know, this is coming as a gas in the hemihydrate, but after that gas, it enters the vacuum cooler, it may be absorbed in the liquid water or it may be released. So, we are telling that is why the reactor gas, the gas coming out from the reactor. And in this dihydrate process, it is a gas which is coming out from the concentrator. So, this is the primary difference. So, we need a gas scrubbing system. So, the gas scrubbing system uses an indirect cooling flow sheet. So, here we, you need a liquor, the liquor may be sea water, it may be pond water, it may be weak uh, fluorine based water, anything. So, you have the evaporator body, then you have the condenser. So, it will condense out, you know the liquid and the barometric seal is to reduce the temperature of that. 
to reduce the temperature it has two purposes it serves two purpose first is it will reduce the energy of the stream and the same time it will reduce the pressure drop so that is the function of parametric seal then again it is pumped and sent to a other heater i'm sorry this is sent to some uh, cooling unit so now this cooling water is separate than the particular liquid water which is recycled because there is the flow sheet or the loop of the cooling water arrangement is different from the loop where the fluorine gets separated so you have one loop present here oh, this is one loop that is the fluorine is again separated out it is cooled and then again recycled back to the condenser and another is the cooling water it is just cools the liquid water so there is no direct contact within these two so what it does is if you have a indirect cooling system it will prevent the spillage of water which is contaminated with fluoride so you don't need to do a uh, direct cooling because if you have a direct cooling because of the heat evolved or released it may spill out okay so to avoid this this indirect cooling flow sheet as shown here is given the scrubber liquid if it is disposed it is disposed after neutralization with limestone to precipitate the fluorine so finally the liquor if it is disposed of is removed as calcium fluoride now calcium fluoride also some uses the calcium fluoride itself can be disposed very easily then uh, what you do is you, you have the 22% fluorosilicic acid coming out from the entire flow sheet so then uh, there is another way out in the indirect flow sheet there is a fluorine recovery and indirect cooling flow sheet again the same thing the evaporator body which is the in dihydrate process you have a entrainment separator so what in the entrainment separator does is it will separate out the part of phosphoric acid separate out the part of phosphoric acid and send to the fit tank of the phosphoric acid manufactured plant so it will you know you have a very low content of the phosphoric acid it is sent back to the plant because you need to recycle it and send it back to the reactor then whatever remaining comes is of mainly it's the fluorine so you hear the difference between previous one it's the fluorine scrubber is present prior to the condenser so the fluorine scrubber what it does it will scrub out the fluorine in the form of fluorosilicic acid then it goes to the condenser where it is washed with the liquor the scrubber liquor and then again goes to the barometric seal which lowers the energy keeping the pressure difference to be least then pumped in and uh, sent to a plate type heat exchanger where cooling water again cools it and uh, again the liquor is again recycled and sent to the condenser okay so the scrubber liquor as i told you it may be fresh water pond water or dilute solution of fluorosilicic acid the liquor is disposed again here also the liquor is disposed after neutralization with limestone to precipitate fluorine as a solid calcium fluoride so both the processes are similar only thing is the fluorine is scrubbed before it enters the condenser so now we have the gypsum so what is the way to dispose of gypsum so gypsum can be disposed to land or it can be disposed to water the land uh, what they do is the dry gypsum is transported by belt conveyors to a storage pile now there should be care taken when you send this dry gypsum because there may still be acid present some water content present in the cakes filter cakes so what you do is you make a ditch where the phosphoric acid is kept so that all the water does not percolate into the soil so the ditch actually collects the remaining water sea water uh, may be preferable as it is soluble in sea water the clean but the issue is only clean gypsum is soluble in sea water you cannot throw out all the gypsum because other it may contain other acids also so it may pollute the sea water itself so if it is clean gypsum there is no water or other acids associated with it you can throw it in the sea water so what are the impurities which which we are not able to throw it out this is the residual acidity this residual acidity primarily is due to the percentage of p2o5 present in the residual streams then you have the fluorine compounds as before then the trace elements may be there other trace elements present in the phosphoric acid are this gypsum impurity then there may be some elements like radon which may produce radioactivity although not much documented it may be very less but these are some impurities actually present in the industrial gypsum so what do you do with the filter cake slurry how it is disposed in land let us see now because we have discussed there is land and sea both the land is the filter cake slurry is discharged to the top of the storage pile what happens is the phosphogypsum settles out of solution 
So it will settle out the solution because it is heavier. The clear water runs off and drains to the adjacent cooling pond. So you prepare a cooling pond where the clear water runs off and drains to the adjacent cooling pond. Water here is recycled within the system to ensure that the contaminants are kept within the plant. So now what it is happens in the land disposal, what you do, you take out the water and it again recycle it back to the plant. Okay. Modern plants are working in that direction is that you should ensure that the contaminants are kept within the plant, so it is recycled. So what are the important design and construction consideration for phosphogypsum disposal location? It includes the site selection. The height of the stacks where it is kept relies on the soil technical qualities and load bearing strength. Then cooling ponds, the cooling ponds, the surfaces of the cooling pond must be suited to local climate and plant water balance. It not be too hot, not too cold, otherwise the crystals will form. So the water balance should also be checked, how much of water is entering the acid recycled and again how much is kept out. So you should keep a track of this entire uh, flow sheet. Then percolation control, phosphogypsum, I told this in the previous slide, the phosphogypsum process, the water is acidic and polluted. So what to not allow this to percolate, the following options are available to prevent water reaching the groundwater. This particular water should not reach the groundwater or it should not go through the soil. So it means these are the different process which industry actually recommends, the seepage collection ditches, intercept wells, the natural barriers, then lining systems or fixing of soluble P2FI when by neutralization. So these are some different things, concepts which I am not going to detail because this does not per into the purview of this particular phosphoric acid, it is more of civil engineering uh, domain. So what you do is intercept wells means you dr uh, draw a well, you draw another well nearby and connect these two well. So that and there put some, uh, if some of the phosphoric acid passes through it can easily intercept it. So that is what intercept well is on natural barrier, so you put some barrier so that the liquid does not pass through. Then lining system, you may also put some lining system, mm, okay. So these are different things or you may fix itself P2O5. So you can neutralize this P2O5. If there is some acid present in that particular uh, liquor, you can neutralize it with the base and then send it to for the recycling. So then the raw material storage is pretty simple, you have the phosphate rock storage, when it comes the phosphate rock is loaded by crane from the ship and transferred to storage via belt conveyor or truck and the phosphoric acid storage is often stored in a rubber lined steel tanks, stainless steel, polyester, polyethylene, PTFE or polyethylene lined concrete. So these are mainly used though know, after, uh, suppose you store it for a long duration of time, it may corrode the surface. So you need some such material of construction or such material of lining. So what are the methods where you rotate or mix it in a reactor? It may either be having air injection, these are the common agitation methods or agitation from the top, jet mixing, agitation from the side or pump circulation and heating, okay. So leak floors are installed beneath hazardous equipment to prevent soil pollution from acid spills, okay. So leaks, so once you store the phosphoric acid, so these uh, you should have a leak floor which is some sort of some barrier so that it does not allow the acid to pass through to the soil. So now you must be knowing that the amount of gypsum formed is 5 times to the amount of acid formed. So if 1 ton of acid is formed annually, you produce 5 tons of gypsum. So then if I compare my input requirement, phosphate rock usage is around 2.6 to 3.5 ton per ton of P2O5 produced. Then what is the consumption of process water? It will depend upon the total flow sheet. So it is almost like 4 to 7 meter cube per ton of P2O5 produced. Consumption of then cooling water because cooling water required to cool that the scrubbing system and also you need to cool it before you send it to the filtration units. So all this requires cooling water. So it is almost close to 100 to 150 meter cube per ton of P2O5 produced. It will also consume steam, so as to heat it, steam is indirect heating, it is almost 0.5 to 2.2 .2 ton per ton of P2O5 produced. So all these are parameters which the industry have come about, so roughly a uh, thumb rule. Then output, 
So, commercial phosphoric acid production, I am repeating again, we have discussed earlier also around 52 to 54 percent P2O5. The production capacity of the plant has now reached in most of the average plants is 1200 tons per day P2O5 production depending upon the process used. So, out of this chlorosilicic acid around 20 to 25 percent is obtained as a byproduct. So, only thing is we have to ensure this does not decompose into silicon tetrafluoride and HF. So, it is obtained as a byproduct. Now, let us see what are the emissions possible into the air. So, if I want to quantify them, the primary emissions on the process are fluoride gases or so secondary emissions may be dust. So, 10 to 15 percent of the fluorine contained in the phosphate rock is released during the acidulation and filtration stages. Scrubbing results in emission containing. So, if you do a scrubbing, you will remove the fluorine so that the final stream has around 10 mg NMQ as fluorine. Okay. So, this is the emission containing for fluorine. Recovery of fluorine from the hemihydrate process is obviously difficult when from evaporated it is relatively high SIF4 content of the gas because when the reaction occurs in a hemihydrate, the gas productions are higher, there itself will get separated the silicon gases along with fluorine. So, SIF4 content is much, much higher as compared to the uh, one in dihydrate. So, this will cause the precipitation of silica in the scrubber. Okay, the recovery of fluorine that is why in hemihydrate process it is difficult as compared to dihydrate. Then water, emissions into water, fluorine from reactors and evaporators are recovered as chlorosilicic acid. The remaining stream may pass to the condenser that contains mainly fluoride and a small amount of phosphoric acid. So, the stream which is remaining after you remove out the acid contain fluoride and a small amount of phosphoric acid as well, weak phosphoric acid. No liquid in closed loop system. So, there should not be any liquid so coming out. So, there should be all the liquid should be preserved within the closed loop system. We have to ensure that and the streams are recycled. So, that emissions into water is not occurring. Water used for transport of this phosphogypsum can be recirculated in the process after settling. Okay. So, it can only possible when there is absence of trace metals. Then solid waste, what are solid waste? Approximately 5 tons of phosphogypsum are produced for each ton of phosphoric acid. Phosphogypsum contains trace elements which are derived from phosphate rock. So, you should be very careful because it has trace elements. So, these are another emission part of uh, waste which is generated because almost 5 tons of phosphogypsum are produced for each ton of phosphoric acid. The environmental hazards associated with emissions and waste. So, what are the environmental hazards? You have the fluoride emissions into air, just now seen, then the dust emission into air, contamination of water and radionuclides. The fluoride emissions into air, the impact of fluoride is released as either silicon tetrafluoride. So, how it is emitted? Either silicon tetrafluoride or hydrogen fluoride, this is one. Dust emission, the dust generated during the processing and grinding of phosphate rock contains around 3 to 4 percent insoluble fluoride, that is another. This is from the into the air only. Then with water, when the gypsum is dumped on water, it gives serious problems on the pH of water engendering the aquatic life. So, it may alter the pH of the water. Then there is another possibility is formation of radionuclides. So, radionuclide exposure is possible, maybe from the form of direct irradiation from gamma radiation. As I told you, there will be some airborne emissions of radon and dust, which may be radioactive and non radioactive both. So, these are the different environmental hazards associated with emissions and waste in a phosphoric acid plant. So, the major hazards can be avoided if the equipment designed using the best engineering sound knowledge that is the phosphoric acid installation provide no risk. So, if you design the equipment accurately then with the best available engineering knowledge the phosphoric acid installation provide thus no major leak, it is a safe procedure. The biggest risk of an acid leakage from storage tank is corrosion. As of now, the acid does not will not leak because uh, it is meant to store because we, we have provided this rubble lined or PTFE or this different lining so that it not. But sometime you know some leak may be uh, there and because of the leak and that part the corrosion may take place. This corrosion takes place thus the acid leakage may take place from the storage tank. 
Also during phosphoric acid loading, the loading pipe could split causing an uncontrolled spill. That also you have to take care, okay. The material how it is transported after the production that has to be carefully taken into account. So what is the occupational health and safety measures or we should uh, be careful about? The phosphoric acid overall is a low toxicity corrosive liquid that can cause burns and respiratory irritation. It can cause skin disease if it is contact with skin. The spray or inhalation may irritate the respiratory tract and lead to lung edema. These are the different uh, you know the hazards associated with the phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid is neither explosive, it is not explosive nor combustible. However, it is less resistant than stainless steel type 316 when in contact with ferrous metals. So, if it is in contact with ferrous metal, it may react. So, you should be very careful, you should not store it in a ferrous type container, ferrous metal based container. So, you should always store in a non ferrous based containers or metals. They normally develop a dangerously high concentration of fluoride gases. So, that is another way. So, a phosphoric acid storage tank which because you know when you have the acid here you may have H2FCI6 also. So, this may decompose and provide this fluoride gases. So, that is another risk. So, appropriate cooperative clothes, goggles and mask must be worn. So, we talk about the BAT emission levels which the European and the US industries follow the best available technique emission techniques. So, for new plants fluoride is 5 milligram the standard set or it is around to 40 grams per ton of P2O5 and uh, dust for dust and particulates is 40 milligram per Newton meter cube. So, emissions from air, emissions from the stack, from the stack itself the fluoride and the dust and particulate matter should be in this uh, numbers. Emissions from gypsum piles and pond areas, so from the stack we know the numbers. Usually the fluoride emission from worldwide worldwide wet and dry gypsum stacking do not have any influence on the environment. From the gypsum piles and pond areas, the, there is not much reports which says that the fluoride gases can escape the atmosphere. So, there is not much monitoring technique methodologies available. So, you do not have to worry about the emission from gypsum piles and pond areas. The emissions into water, both the process water and the water used for transport and disposal of phosphogypsum must be recycled in full at new facilities. So, to prevent the emission into water or to prevent the water contamination, all the water must be recycled back into the plant. It should not be thrown open and sent it to the open pond or in the open sea. For the solid waste, it propagates the following, the phosphogypsum should be disposed of in a land in newly built facilities. The system should be built to prevent polluted water from entering the adjacent groundwater system. So, it means it should not the other water, the remaining water should not enter the groundwater. There should be some ditches or some other facility where you can collect this water. So, what are the achievable for new plants? Earlier is the old plant. I am sorry, the other way around. What I discussed was for the newer plants. So, if you see in the existing plants, these values are higher. So, now since the plants are already there, a lot of retrofitting has to be done. So, they have allowed with a higher concentration of fluoride and dust or particulate matter. So, emissions into water also now they are suggesting to adopt open loop reactors to closed loop. So, they are suggesting to close the open loop reactors and make them closed loop reactor to avoid process water discharge. So, disposal must be limited and the fluent treated. Then we come to the solid waste. For solid waste, what they are proposing for the estate existing plants is where water disposal has been practiced, further disposal will be limited to 10 to 20 percent of gypsum provided that the disposal is agreeable to the receiving water. Okay. So, they have set a limit of 10 to 20 percent of the gypsum, that is the limit for the disposal of solid waste. So, I conclude this lecture. So, most of this phosphoric acid can be found in this bulletin, this bulletin of production of phosphoric acid. This is uh, booklet number 4 to 8 from the European Fertilizer Manufacturing Association. So, it was available and most of this data have been taken from this particular uh, booklet. So, I will just provide this, uh, the link is there, you can just type it and just go through it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.